Thomas Rutic, thank you ever so much for coming on the show to share your story of Afghanistan. You've, of course, you and Afghanistan go a long way back. So let's talk about that. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, you studied Afghanistan at university. You were born in East Germany. Mm-hmm. But it was. I mean, for my generation, it, it it feels a million years away. But, you know, where we are in the geopolitics and power politics of the world at the moment, it, it makes a prescient sense to have a look at the history of that time. Uh, but let's talk about your initial encounters with Afghanistan, because born in East Germany, you went to university to study Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that course was uh, the first one ever held in that uh, composition. And uh, there were Iranian studies at Humboldt University in Berlin where I studied. So you could also learn Farsi and uh, Dari. We fell under something which was then called regional sciences or regional studies, Afghanistics, so mm-hmm. to say. Um, and they added Pashto and a lot of uh, knowledge about the country. But it uh, was the first thing. So we had a professor who spoke Pashto and Dari and was in, has been in Afghanistan uh, uh, frequently and a couple of others. And then they were flying in. Uh, language teachers from Kabul University. There was a partnership between Humboldt University and Kabul University, and that was uh, really great. And I still remember uh, my teachers, um, wherever they are now, some are here in Germany, one is in the US and so on. Mm. And uh, I never forgot uh, how they taught us. And What year are we talking about? So what, what, when did you, when did you do it? That uh, was starting, the course was starting 1980, so, but uh, we had a centrally planned economy, so there was a little yeah. bit of um, run-up time. So actually, there was a decision made on the government level when the glorious Sauer Revolution, as it called itself, happened yeah. in April 78, um, that uh, all of a sudden they realized we have some new comrades in Afghanistan running the country there, or trying to. And they needed people who can talk to them. And then they, they decided to have a course for, it was first Pashto. We started with Pashto. And then in the second year, in the third semester, we started with Dari. It was um, five years all in all. And it had uh, a component of uh, six months uh, language practicum at Kabul University, Faculty of Literature and Languages. And that was... That was great, and that's when I really got hooked to Afghanistan. And what I mean, do you remember what attracted you to to do that? I mean, you had this course available for you to do that. I mean, what is it that that moved you towards that? I didn't know? know. I didn't know too much about Afghanistan. I was kind of. I actually wanted to study something else about another country, but they didn't have the course that year. And then he said, "But we have something new. It's about Afghanistan. Uh, what about this? Do you want to join?" And I said, "Well, yeah, that sounds." exciting too so i'm going for it and the decision didn't take longer than i'm telling you now and you know that that part of history is so fascinating and, and as i mentioned earlier because of you know our, our generation we we take what came after you know the collapse of the wall for granted mm-hmm. i mean one of the reasons i suppose we are here we are because of the way we took things for granted as a given you know the end of history for a lot of people, we became complacent, and the end of history was really the end of history. Mm-hmm. And you know, we are we are, I suppose, collecting the rewards for those years of complacency. Afghanistan was added to the block, and you just talk about the environment in East Germany being at the forefront of, you know, West versus East, and the height of the Cold War being a key part of the the Eastern Bloc and Afghanistan added to the mix. Just talk about those days. Well, the thing was, as I said, I mean, the, our course was uh, designed for political reasons. And uh, of course, we were taught the official version on Afghanistan and what was happening there. Um, when the course was designed, uh, it was still only the Hezbo Demokratik Khalq. Mm-hmm. Uh, without the Soviets, uh, trying to get the Soviets involved. And then uh, Christmas 
79 happened um, and the Soviet troops uh, invaded and that changed the whole thing. And um, I was on the holidays somewhere in the mountains, not much of radio reception. Uh, and there was no internet in those days. And I thought, oh, there, there's something going on. And it was not clear what was happening. So some military movements, tanks and whatever. And I thought, oh, so that's the end of your Afghanistan study before it has started. But uh, of course, as allies of the Soviet Union, East Germany or German Democratic Republic, as we called ourselves, um, was prone to support the leading ally, the USSR, a little bit like uh, other Western countries supported or saw themselves obliged to support the Americans after 2001 uh, yeah. in the framework of NATO. In those days, it was on, on our side, so to say, the Warsaw Pact, of course. And the thing was, uh, one of the advantages of East Germany was that you were not only, <clears throat> um, or you did not only have to rely on what was uh, uh, told on the official media and so on. Our um, lecturers were quite good and differentiated on, on Afghanistan and its social realities and so on. And then, of course, we had access to Western media. So I was listening. <clears throat> excuse me, to the BBC and to uh, West German TV and radio. I was actually I had an old tape recorder, you know, and I was taping everything and then typing everything for my... Um, it's, it's still here in the <laughs> <laughs> in the room. And uh, um, I always wanted to, to, to write something about how it was reported then on the Eastern side and so on, but, but other things came. I mean, you, so, you... Yeah, it was the situation in Cold War and then in... Uh, 1983, for the first time, we went to Kabul for that course there, for the language course. And uh, of course, we were prepared what was uh, expecting us and uh, that there was a war uh, uh, ongoing. Uh, rockets were fired into Kabul. Hmm. Um, we were in the dormitory of Kabul University, which was a large underground shelter for all kinds of people, people trying to escape being drafted forcibly into the army or the police and uh, underground mujahideen yeah. and stuff like that and uh, hard watchers on each floor intelligence service and uh, we talked to all of them sometimes not knowing whom they belong to but finding out later and so on uh, it was harsh because you saw how the war impacted the population and um, no one who's halfway human can close its eyes. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, uh, even if you're ideologically kind of supposed to see something different or don't see a couple of things. You, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the the Soviet invasion, the December, I think it was day before Christmas that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, 1979. Do you know there was a story, uh, as a big story in, in Western in, in the Western world, Sergei Skripal, you know, the Russian, the former Russian double agent who worked for the British and was poisoned by Russian operatives in the UK. Do you remember that episode a couple of years ago? It's a few years ago. And Sergei Skripal's, I read it in a book by Mark Urban, you know, the British journalist who, yeah. you know, he's he's a very... He, he's quite good at his at, at what he's doing. Uh, so he's got a book on the on on Sergei, Sergei Skripal's. Sergei Skripal's was among the Spetsnaz forces who stormed Hafiz al Amin's palace. Oh, I so see. He just yeah. tells you how connected the whole things are, and <laughs> and, and he was. Uh, and then you the books about Afghanistan. I must have missed. Yeah, so he he's just quite good because he he he. <laughs> You know, his book is about the story of Sergei Skripal because it became such a huge diplomatic and you know issue between the West and uh, and 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 Russia. Now, you after completing your course, you became an East German diplomat, right? And then you started working in Kabul. So, how were those days working as an East German diplomat in Kabul like? Yeah, well, it was not immediately after that, but it uh, doesn't matter too much. I started in 85. Um, I was a uh, press attaché at the East German Embassy in Kabul. 
And uh, as uh, <clears throat> we did with our fellow students when we were there during university days, um, speaking the language, I had a little bit more room to maneuver to talk with people directly and also much more openly because not many people were able to to overhear that on, on our side. And I took myself also, as other colleagues also did, a bit more room to go and visit people and uh, talk openly. But of course, I mean, we were meant to um, defend the Soviet actions in Afghanistan, which we actually didn't have to do in practice too often because it was all clear. And then in, in Kabul, there were almost no diplomats uh, from the Western side. Um, so there was a Turkish colleague who later became a Turkish uh, special envoy to Afghanistan who was there. So there were a couple of people I met then in, in junior positions who later became famous, like uh, Mr. Kabulov in Moscow. Oh, and really? Was, oh, God. You met yeah, he was at the, in I Moscow? Mean, I'm, I'm actually not Kabul. sure whether we met in person. But he was around. He was around at Najibullah's uh, lawyer Jerga in 86, 87. So these so guys really do go back a long way in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, of course. He also speaks the languages. And apart from everything uh, for which policy he now stands, uh, he, I think he knows the country very well. But does that Kabulov, nothing to do with Kabul, right? It's just a coincidence that his name is Kabulov. Yeah, I think so. I think he has some Uzbek origin at least partly or something ah. Could be Kabulov or uh, I don't know but but Maybe how was something to do with Kabuli Palau who knows oh okay no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> and uh, so there was this what I, you know I was thinking about I, I read somewhere where recently I think in a, in, in a book that I can't uh, seem to get into my head at the moment the title about the the relationship between East Germany and the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. I don't know what is it about the communists calling themselves democratic republics. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. but how close, you know, during the Soviet occupation, how close was the relationship between East Germany and Afghanistan? And also what role was East Germany playing in bolstering the Soviets' occupation of Afghanistan, or at least the presence of the Eastern Bloc or the group of the Eastern Bloc on Afghanistan? Well, it played a role. It played a secondary role because the US, uh, the, <laughs> the USSR was the lead power. They also dominated uh, the military sphere and so on. And uh, the GDR, like uh, other countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia of those days, etc., had uh, trade relations, there were cultural relations, there were students uh, sent uh, to, to our countries where they studied, and um, Afghan students were very often at, at the top, um, because they're very, very eager to pick up things and so on, that's what also was visible after 2001. Um, we sent so-called specialists and advisors uh, to Afghanistan that was mainly in the education field. Um, you might uh, remember that West Germany, uh, Federal Republic, was very close with Afghanistan after Second World War and yeah. was amongst the three biggest givers of aid. Um, there was uh, the then Loya Paktia development project and so on, and, and uh, very... Uh, outstanding project was uh, Lycea Amani, the Amani School, which was founded on Amanullah and was then called Najat School. And it was uh, the first address to learn German and uh, with also West German teachers and then a lot of Afghan teachers who took over. And uh, after the Soviet uh, invasion, West Germany decided to pull them out. And the Afghan leadership, the new Afghan leadership came to East Germany and said, could you take that over, please? We want to continue. Uh, German, uh, the German courses, so to say, and and also want to keep up that school. But uh, East Germany was not that uh, rich as West Germany, and then they also they probably didn't want to take over something what the West Germans did before, and decided yes, we will continue, but not at Amani School. There was a school Mahmoud Hutaki, mm. uh, Lycee uh, Mahmoud Hutaki, opposite of uh, Kabul University entrance 
where there were German courses, and then there were also uh, German language teachers from East Germany who taught at uh, that faculty where I studied. Um, there was also a Schubert, Zaban Almani, so an Afghan um, uh, German language department. Yeah, things like that. And I also in the kindergarten department and uh, did some something for electricity supply and the printing press, which was the party printing press, but also newspapers were printed there and so on. Um, and there was also some collaboration between the intelligence services. I have. To yeah, say. that's I what I was going to ask. I mean, because yeah. you know, Chad was in 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 certain ways. I I, I was you know again. I, I I just can't bring that book into my head again. Chad was influenced a lot by the Stasi, and 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 or or that's that's not right. And also, you know, East Germany was actually helping the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan at the time in its war effort against the Mujahideen because it was, you know, a, a great threat to, you know, a member of the bloc. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> You know, after East Germany ended and in the process of reunification, we had something uh, which was called the round table, like what mm. also happened in Poland and so on. And, and I, when I came back from my embassy job, I actually was, I actually learned in Afghanistan, not from scratch, but about um, how good pl uh, political pluralism is and uh, yeah. democracy and whatever. It was the Gorbachev times, you know. And yeah. uh, Najibullah tried to emulate that, at least in some fronts, also in the media and so on. There were uh, halfway independent newspapers. Perestroika. Like Is it Perestroika? Yeah. Yeah, Perestroika and uh, uh, Glasnost, uh, open, yeah. openness. And, and that was, we found that fascinating. And when I went back to Germany, um, I joined one of the opposition groups and uh, was delegated to one particular special round table on development policies. And there we actually found documents, lists of items sent from Stasi to their hard counterparts in Afghanistan, which was mainly technical stuff, but also there was some stuff which I think you could uh, put to dual use, to put it very mildly, like, uh, you know, telephones and stuff, which were also used for torture. I'm not sure whether the East German phones were used for that or capable of doing that, I hope. Those people made sure uh, it did not happen, but um, yeah, there probably were also courses, so, but I'm, I'm not really aware of that. And then there was also, of course, uh, there were uh, uh, probably also weapons delivered. But the funny thing is also we had this kind of clandestine, I mean, official, but clandestine East German foreign trade mm. set up of companies who were I mean, the East was under blockade for high tech and so on. So they were yeah. purchasing that kind of through uh, shadow firms. And so they also bought Warsaw Pact weapons mm. and sold them to the Mujahideen. Oh. Or to the Americans and they gave it to the Mujahideen or something. That's like that. double dealing. Well, yes. People you know, were working. Yeah. I mean, it was a Cold War and it was not that black and white. It was quite shady from time to time. Um, so that also, I mean, when you were there and you learned, I mean, I didn't learn about those particular things that was mm. after. But down there, that things are much more complicated on, on all sides. I mean, that opened up my mind and my eyes uh, for also my future. Yeah, working. and I, I was, I was, I was watching a, a speech uh, that you gave at one of the, uh, you know, German think tanks, and there you. You know, you take a tour of Afghanistan's history and its relationship with Germany, and mm. the sense of, you know, Afghan millat, you know, Afghan, the sense of Afghan nationhood became an ideological thing after Amanullah Khan. Or and and um, there well, was then you started with the Iron Amir, Amir yes, Rahman Khan, yeah. yes, and um, uh, so what I wanted to say, there was this, there was this, there's, uh, you know. As, as you know, Sima, Dr. Sima Sama's book's recently out, mm -hmm. um, Outspoken, My Fight for Freedom and Democracy, or Human Rights in Afghanistan. And there's a, there's an anecdote where, so Dr. Sama and Dr. Abdullah, uh, I think, and they're accompanying Hamid Karzai to Germany uh, mm -hmm. for a visit. And in there's a reception for them, and Karzai speaks. And in his speech, Karzai, to, to thank the German people, 
and showed the affinity and the closeness of the relationship, the historical relationship between the German people and the Afghans, he says in that speech to say, you know, we go a long, a long way back. We're long-time friends. Uh, and, you know, during the Second World War, Afghans prayed for Germany. And, and you know, when he sat down, the German president at the time, I, I th- or prime minister, or chancellor, Gerhard Schröder, I think, he stood up and, you know, gave a proper lecture to, you know, to Hamid Karzai as to why Germany is not really proud of that time. We've owned our past. We we've learned our lessons from the past, but we're not proud of that. So if you were to, so it suppose it shows the level of ignorance at the top level of the Afghan politics, but also this sense of closeness and that idea that taken root in Afghanistan, especially the Afghan nationalists in the early twentieth century, that we are part of an Aryan Aryan race, and you can see the airlines Aryan, and and just talk about that and where, where does that come from? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a complicated history on on, on both sides. And uh, I mean, if we look at German-Afghan relations, it started actually during World War I, when the Kaiser, the, the German emperor, wanted to draw, I mean, he declared together with the Ottoman Sultan Jihad against their enemies in Europe, France, Russia, and Britain, who all had colonies, and amongst them colonies in Muslim-majority countries. So, and they wanted to draw Afghanistan into their ranks. Um, that was uh, under Amanullah's father, Habibullah. Um, the Afghans were not disinclined, but their money still came from the Brits, and uh, they knew that uh, probably the Germans would not be able to uh, replicate that, as the East Germans were not able to replicate with the yeah. Amani Lisa. Uh, the West Germans <laughs> later on. It's a bit uh, strange comparison, but um, yeah. Um, so it didn't happen, and then uh, the Nazi Nazi Germany did the same thing during Second World War, also uh, in in vain. Although there were a lot of sympathies uh, in Afghanistan uh, for the Germans, because that's my explanation, and I also heard that very often from from Afghan friends, of course. The Germans were never seen as a colonial threat to Afghanistan, but the Brits were, and uh, later the Americans and uh, Russia in the north. So Germany was always the the third guy, the good guy. So um, Germany was not part of the great game because they had no stake in that great game. Yeah, not really. There were some elements, of course, during World War One. I. I mean, that's when it all started and, and, and early on. But of course, Germany didn't have uh, colonies there or also not a really large presence. That started under the Nazis in the early 1930s. Um, They had a very big embassy um, in in Kabul, and I think they brought the first cinema uh, uh, to Kabul. And of course, the Afghan elite was invited to the embassy to watch movies, and there was a lot of Nazi propaganda. And I mean, when you have um, studied about Afghanistan like I did, you you know all the English literature, Hmm. Elfson and whatever, Burns and... uh, about the Afghans, particularly the Pashtuns, uh, saying we are the lost tribe of uh, Israel. Yeah. Um, and then the Germans came and said, no, 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 you're not. You are Aryans. And you. Um, the thing started, and you heard a lot of nationalist historians who picked up that story. I mean, if you go into linguistics and so on, it makes sense. There was, uh, uh, or there's something which used to be called the uh, language family of the Indo-Aryan languages, which is, covers almost everything between Iceland and Sri Lanka, with a couple of exceptions. And that was later renamed into the uh, Indo-European uh, family of languages and so on. So all these things, they, they, they um, probably... Uh, were welcome uh, to the Afghans. Also, I mean, there was that, let's call it nation building uh, project, uh, which started under the young uh, last king, uh, Mohammed Zahir Shah, mm. and his uh, prime ministers, uh, uh, kind of industrializing, uh, making new land arable, particularly the Helmand project, which then 
which was started by the Japanese and then taken by the Americans and so on. But there also was a German role. A couple of factories uh, were established in Afghanistan. So Germany had a good name. And what did Afghans know outside the elite about the political misgivings uh, or no not not misgivings about uh, the policies of the nazis in in, in germany and um, that kind of spread i mean i was writing an article in my blog and i also published it in english on my on, on, on the an website later about my how i was from day one in afghanistan i was approached as usual people ask you where you're from from germany oh mm. hitler is a great man that was very often uh, the first or the second sentence which came then. Sometimes I was more lucky it was Beckenbauer or Klinsmann, but yeah. most often it was uh, Adolf Hitler. And it came from everyone, Pashtun, Tajik, um, from Hazaras. You know, there's a, uh, I, I went and, and uh, took photos of all those little institutions and large institutions which had that Ariana or mm. Arya name. There was a Hazara run Photoshop and, and which was called Arya, and I went in and asked uh, the guys who were Hazara, so why is your shop called Arya? I said, because we're Aryans. Um, so it's very deep there, and uh, very often it is um, kind of innocent because they don't know. Mm. Uh, but sometimes when I felt, and you were talking about the, the lecture uh, Schröder gave to, to Karzai, very often I also had to give lectures to people I considered more educated or more open and said, no, that's not a positive story and whatever. And uh, I remember one encounter on a Kabul street where someone asked me, where are you from? Just passing by. He came mm. from one of the ministries and said, Germany. Oh, Hitler was a great man. I said, he killed six million Jews. Do you think that's great? He said, yes, I do so. Yes, I mean, you know, anti-Semitism, mm. you know, it's not, con it's not controversial to say anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews, is so widespread in that is in that country, and of course, given the level of education, conspiracy theory is so entrenched, yeah. and a lot of people that 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 you know that that willfully choose conspiracy theories over facts any yeah. any time of the day, and and it's yeah, just so painful. Quite often, yeah, yeah. And, but um, also but, a lot of openness and uh, uh, people who understood. Um, and were able to listen and so on. So I mean, but how did that make you? You know, how did that make you feel as a German? You know, I'm, I'm I, you know, you encounter that quite often, as you said, in Afghanistan. But mm. how, you know, mentally, emotionally, how, you know, given, you know, the heavy shadow that period still carries on over Germany. I mean, how how does that make you feel? How did it make you feel on the emotional level? Not you, you, you can make an explanation to somebody, but of course, deep down, how did that make you feel? Well, it uh, made me feel when I was there as an East German um, that you're still German and you're still considered to be part of that nation, of that country who did uh, all those atrocities. And um, But it, I was not surprised that it would happen. I mean, um, we were actually, when, when I was at, uh, when we were there as, as students, our embassy, East German embassy, told us, uh, don't tell the people you're from East Germany, just say you're Germans. And uh, our people were driving around with a West German flag, uh, the black, red, uh, mm. gold. Um, we had, the East had this emblem in the middle, which was not uh, so different. So, yeah, but I mean, it's it's a general thing. It's it, it made me think about history and how history is taught and uh, communicated and what people know and what they learn at school and university and whatnot. And um, yeah, it was not so that I felt, I don't know, um, attacked or something mm. for that. Um, when I felt it came from someone who could know better, I was picking my verbal fight. And yeah. uh, I always remember, I mean, we were walking around with our Afghan friends and my colleagues, they already knew, oh, that's Thomas's <clears throat> yeah. favorite thing. And now, no, let's see whether he will just smile, make a joke or, or go into some yeah. discussion. But I think, but you know, looking at, looking at Germany and the way it's conducted, it's, you know, it's reevaluated its history and the lessons learned and the way it's accepted its past as 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 facts and 
try to, you know, successfully to refound itself as a country that it is today, one of the most successful open countries in the world. And dare I say, beautiful, welcoming, kind, generous. And Afghanistan, you know, you know more than most, has had such a bloodied, complicated history since its birth. But it's not had as a country a moment of reflection that, you know, we've done wrong to the Hazaras in the 19th century. We've done wrong, you know, to ourselves in many decades and, you know, years. We've had this continuous pouring of blood. But how is it that Afghanistan as a country have never had that German kind of self-reflection? What, what makes it complicated for Afghanistan? Let me say two sentences about Germany first. Um, yes, we tried a lot to be honest about our past and admit the atrocities both in East and West, but currently we have a large backlash. Mm. Um, we have between 20 and 30 percent of our voters who vote for a party who denies that to AFD. a large extent. AFD. That makes me very angry and also anxious about what the future will hold because it's not just a German phenomenon. We have that almost everywhere in, in Europe and other countries. Um, but yeah, we want to talk about I mean, so even if you kind of successfully tackle this, it's not clear whether it holds for a long time over the, the, the generations. Mm -hmm. But still, in Afghanistan, that's still a very large white area which needs to be covered and it's probably because of all the instability and the wars and crises which afghanistan was facing um particularly after world war ii although it was peaceful mm. for, for for quite a while also during world war ii um what many people forget who in europe run around and say oh the afghans love weapons and and war is their metier and graveyard of empires and all that um let me say bullshit um <laughs> yeah but then the reflect and also the i mean all those wars and particularly those starting around the soviet invasion it, it happened before i mean there were mm. was a political split between the islamists and the leftists in afghanistan and it, well, it was all still small scale but still it was a split and um, also polarization which then when weapons were taken up uh, became uglier and uglier and deeper and deeper and um, because so many people have been killed on all sides blood has been spilled it's very difficult to get uh, over that 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 we know in in, in germany also mm. um but in afghanistan that has not taken place and that's also one of my major criticisms of what happened under the US Western led attempt to build something in Afghanistan after 2001 that particularly on that what was labeled as transitional justice or whatever taking stock of human rights abuses uh, war crimes uh, in all those uh, decades uh, committed by all sides um there was just not um, a breathing space and also politics became so polarized after 2001 because there was there has been no i wouldn't say no opportunity there were always opportunities to do something like that. but it was the the opportunity was not taken to sit down particularly after let's say 1992 when the soviets were gone when the najib government uh, collapsed the mujahideen came they could have sat down and say, okay, now let's take stock and uh, talk with each other. But they even could not talk to each other, all the different Tanzims mm. and so on. And, and the wars just continued and uh, um, became very bad and ugly again. So, yeah, that was, and, and that the Western powers who actually set the course largely after 2001. And I don't want to take away the responsibility from the Afghan elites, these low elites. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the 2000... Um, that, that, that this was not kind of implemented. I still hear it. I was there with the UN and the European Union and later as a researcher. It was always, don't rock the boat. 
Um, we need the former Mujahideen, we need the warlords, we need the commanders. Um, as you uh, uh, said in one of your other podcasts with a EU diplomat, uh, we want them having, we want them in the tent, not outside the tent. Uh, we want them in the tent, pissing actually, out. Not... Yeah, they they got that they got them into the tent and they sold it from inside. That that was the problem. Knowing Afghanistan, speaking the language, experienced working there, and then the whole the entire you know world west east collapsed and the whole thing changed. Um, you know, during the nineties, how was it looking? At Afghanistan from from the outside, and how are you feeling about those those years? And then, of course, two thousand one happened, and the Bonn conference, which you were part of as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was on the UN team, and I thought uh, we could pull off something together with the Afghans, like what we pulled up pulled it off in in, in uh, East Germany, kind of uh, democratization process. Um. I mean, when the wall came down and uh, the government I was working for and the entire state I was uh, growing up and where I got my education, which wasn't too bad, um, disappeared. I, I had to do with myself and my, my family first because uh, I suddenly didn't have a job and need to look around. I became a journalist, not a very well-paid one, but uh, in one of those uh, opposition-run newspapers then, which was a great experience to talk with all those people who were politically on the on the other side before. And um, I thought that's something I could probably bring also to Afghanistan. And we made a couple of attempts, particularly during the first years. My wife was also there. She was then working for uh, German foundations. We were cooperating with people from a couple of EU countries, with people from the US foundations, to help to set up political parties to reflect the plurality of Afghan society. Um, and uh, also to help to implement what was decided uh, in the Bonn conference by Afghan factions, mainly armed factions, but there were also a couple of others, um, and who clearly wanted to go towards a uh, setup in, in, in the country which was more democratic, so at least taking things into their own hands again, which uh, happened after being occupied first by the Soviets, um, then uh, going through a couple of regimes who made things uh, worse, as some people say. I mean, that of the Mujahideen and the Taliban. And they, they thought, I very often heard that from, from a lot of Afghan friends who said, I mean, our own people can't do it. You have to do it, mm. the West. Um, and there were so much hopes into that democratic West and also including Germany, you know, with that reunification. And we Afghans helped you, we brought down the Soviet Union, helped to bring down the Soviet Union, the wall came yeah. down, so do something for us. And uh, I could understand that and uh, try it also to, to help to put that into practice and we're trying those things. But there was not a big interest in democratization. Um, the elites in Afghanistan, the... Mujahideen leaders and others associated with them who were brought, uh, some of them back into power, uh, were not really interested. They, they were interested in democracy when they would win and they would do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot that they win. And I saw almost all elections in Afghanistan, particularly the first one, starting with that for the emergency lawyer Jirga in 2002 and then on and on. for Which you were there as well. Yeah, yeah, I helped to organize it and constitutional lawyer Jirga and and the first uh, presidential and parliamentary election. So and there was so much intimidation and um, also manipulation from the first moment um, that I actually lost my hope that it uh, goes into the right direction quite quite early on. And that it actually, to be honest, I, I've been asked that question quite often. When did you start? When when do you think uh, did it? start to go wrong I, I would say at the emergency lawyer jerga that's uh and was it may june 2002 that was uh, when we tried to hold elections some people in academic papers have written the most democratic elections so far in in, in afghanistan's history but they were only half democratic mm. i could go into that but i don't it takes too much time and then uh, uh we also tried together with the 21 member uh Commission, independent commission for the organization of the emergency lawyer Jirga Afghan members together with them to keep out 
let's call it armed influence on on the decisions to be made there on the political decisions but it didn't work and the worst thing was that my own organization the un or some people some very leading people in the un actually undermined that by uh putting one of the major um parts of uh, um that commissions work uh, out of power uh, that uh, people who were in arm in, in, in positions of uh, in the armed forces i mean nds so intelligence yeah um, police and army could not be candidates for the lawyer jirga and those areas where they wield armed power that was taken off and then uh, uh, the un together with then head of the interim administration karzai came and they agreed okay we have some 50 additional people sent to the lawyer jirga and that were all those people who were kind of filtered out kind of the warlords or very strong local commanders and they came to the emergency lawyer jirga to the dormitory where the delegations uh, uh, were housed uh, hoping for you now doing their share for for a let's call it the democratic afghanistan i'm not sure whether every one of them would call it the democratic afghanistan but it would have been one at least going towards that and they were told by those additional 50 delegates okay you can do democracy here but don't forget you have to come back to your provinces um and you know uh, these these Im impl uh, implied threats mm -hmm. they did not need to say when you're there you will be under my influence and i can do something for you or as what we heard later on we will break your legs if you don't do this or that or if you do this and that um so that was very violent and that's when i thought uh, it's going into the wrong direction and then there was a gentleman who later played a leading role in the us for the Doha agreement in 2021 so I, I, was, I was going to ask about him because because he was you know he was he's been credited or discredited or disgraced whatever you want to put it he was the he was the, the man orchestrating political shenanigans in 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 the Bonn conference because you know he was America's man, and of course he was the man pulling the strings in the first lawyer jirga. He was the man behind providing security for you know for the powers of Hamid Karzai. So he was America's person. He was the you know he had the the the, the hopes and. Uh, I suppose, of the future of a country in his hands, and he played it badly. So, you know, what would be your your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, we can uh, uh, tell his name, Zaman Khalizat. Yes. Um, I think he's one of the major people responsible for, not only because of how he conducted the Doha talks, but already how he conducted emergency lawyer jury and so on for that that uh, afghanistan went down the drain in 2021 That's I mean, did, you, did you have encounters with him i've been in meetings where my bosses met him yeah and how did he operate i mean what kind of an operator he is i find that difficult to answer but what i saw is that of course with his afghan background and speaking the languages he did a lot of the talks with his interlocutors, his Afghan interlocutors in his own language. I mean, I was not in those meetings. I don't know what he said, but I can imagine what he did. And no one was able actually to see what he was doing in detail. I'm not sure how much he reported or had to report uh, to the big bosses in, in, in Washington, but I think to a large extent he had carte blanche. Mm. And I, he used I, it. And you... You know, you continued working on Afghanistan. You worked for the UN. You worked for the EU. Then you found the, this brilliant uh, organization, the Afghanistan Analyst Network, which is done an incredible amount of good work. I co-founded uh, it. Co-founded it, yes. Uh, so talk about, you know, talk about Afghanistan Analyst Networks and why why it became such a a good source of analysis research on Afghanistan. One of the bright spots of researching. Afghanistan, you know, has been that that outlet. Thank you very much for for your kind words. Um, I'm very proud about that, and um, um, that time was just incredible to do independent analysis of Afghanistan. I mean, we founded it in 2009. I think it was a 
group of people. We were the team, the advisors to the then EU special representative, uh, Ambassador Francis Quindrell, who passed away not too long ago, unfortunately. And uh, uh, we were writing those reports in the EU system, and, and uh, they were, of course, internal, and they were flying around left, right, and center, and everyone wanted to read them. Um, and uh, when we stopped working there, there was a new uh, ambassador coming in, and we wanted to to end that. We were encouraged to set up a think tank mm. uh, by people who said, we need uh, people like you um, to give an independent voice and, and analysis and, and assessment and so on. And, and we had been thinking about that. We're a little bit slow. And then actually someone offered the money. And uh, one government, it was no way, uh, no, uh, n not to make a mistake about our donors now. Um, it started with Sweden, Carl Bildt, mm. um, former um, foreign minister. Um, and we said, yeah, I mean, we would like to write those reports and we would write continue writing these reports but for the public we wanted to inform the public the afghan public and the international public um not so much about kind of influencing policy we hoped of course that it would have an effect but we also had learned during our being un diplomats and eu diplomats and so on that's very difficult to mm. really have an impact because capitals only hear what they want to hear and so on and uh, um, they don't want to hear the, the bad news. And, and uh, we were actually also writing about a lot of bad news and things we thought would go wrong. And I have to really underline it was not just that that team that were uh, three people who worked at the EU embassy, plus my wife, who's up to mm. now our admin head. And I'm very grateful for her because without her, I would never have spent so much time in Afghanistan. And uh, well, um, our Afghan colleagues, we then recruited mm. one after the other. Such a great team, scattered now all around the world. Some found some bases and are continuing to research and to write and so on. And I always have said, and that's not a diplomatic sentence, I learned everything about Afghanistan from Afghans and from mm. a few others also. And um, yeah, so we continued writing and uh, the organization is ongoing. I'm, I'm, I'm retired. I'm just writing a little bit from time to time, um, which has to do with the 2021 thing, because everything we were hoping to achieve finally collapsed and we had to take care of our colleagues first. And that was what my wife and I did, first of all. And, and you know, you, you brought us to... To 2021, um, you know, where were you when you, you know, you saw those scenes from the airport, and how did that make you feel? I was here, and I was watching that, and I was, although it didn't come surprisingly, it came that it came so quickly was also surprising to me and, and to us who were still trying to analyze things. Um, but it was a shock, but we didn't have much time to be shocked because we needed to do something for our colleagues. And uh, mm. we had this, um, well, we organized to get most of them out. Um, and that took a lot of our time. And uh, of course, uh, seeing that, that people lose their lives, their livelihoods, their jobs they liked, um, just overnight um, is so shocking already to watch it. It's incomprehensible how difficult it must be if you're one of them. And you know, you there's this thing. You know, you 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 just mentioned about your efforts to to bring your colleagues out and save them and their families. Um, so I want to talk about this thing. Germany has done comparatively much better in evacuating people who were stuck and needed to be evacuated in Afghanistan. Actually, no. No? No, the others were even worse, probably. But Yeah, this, I mean, the UK yeah. and others have been absolutely yeah. atrocious. Yeah, but but in, yeah. in terms of comparatively, I mean, Germany's yeah. done relatively well. Yeah. In, in... That's, that's a less than half full glass, believe mm. me. I've been deeply involved with that and know a lot of people. Um, 
who worked on that, and that's particularly non-governmental people. I mean, they set up the whole mechanism to get people out over the border because the German government said, we can't do that. They closed the embassy. They were not giving visa to Afghans for a long time since that uh, lorry bomb attack there a couple of years yeah. ago. I forgot which year it was. Um, yes, they got out a couple of people, those uh, uh, ministries who were interested and didn't have too many people like Ministry of Interior brought out their police project people. Um, the development ministry here decided, no, we don't need to evacuate uh, our Afghan colleagues because we will continue to work in Afghanistan, also under the Taliban. Afghanistan is still a, a humanitarian case. It needs development aid and so on. So we need them. They need to stay. And uh, because they are with Germany or because we're doing good things to Afghanistan, um, they are not in, in, under threat, which, of course, those people perceived quite differently and that was blocked for a very long time that they could uh, go out of the country and uh, defense ministry uh, uh, was a bit uh, better uh, but they had said uh, everyone who worked for us after 2013 can uh, is eligible for evacuation it still doesn't mean you will be evacuated because there's a lot of bureaucratic procedure and still to, to cut the very long story short uh, still people and families waiting in Afghanistan to be uh, evacuated and they usually have to make their way to one of the neighboring countries uh, themselves but uh, uh, there's also a program which was a very good idea it was part of the coalition treaty of our current government uh, in uh, 2021 um, I mean, we had election campaign while Afghanistan's uh, Islamic Republic was collapsing. Um, so they didn't want to bring in too many Afghans because of our extreme right wing, because it was, oh, you're bringing in more of those Muslim terrorists and blah, blah. And that's uh, still continuing. I mean, we um, there was that program or there is that program for people who work with German funded organizations or NGOs and people who worked in the women's human rights sphere, journalists and so on. And a lot of NGOs were doing a lot to get those people out, but the government very often was not helpful. Yes, there's a number, a large number, and I think in the five digits of people who came here, but there are many more who are there. And there are people who have been ruled out from the beginning, which are not less threatened than those who are on, on, on those lists and still hoping. So it's a very, very, very mixed picture. And also the welcome here in Germany is not that great anymore. Um, I mean, Germany accepts a lot of refugees from yeah. all over the world. It's, I think, number four or five worldwide. Um, also per... Uh, head, I think, of the population, maybe not amongst top five, but not not very low. Um, and then we have the war in Ukraine, a lot of Ukrainians coming here who were kind of prioritized, which yeah. is a problem, particularly when you look at it from an Afghan angle, which yeah, I yeah, yeah, continue yeah. to do. And so people ending up here are treated like um, the regular asylum seeker. Uh, it takes a long time until they get their language courses, which then is the prerequisite if you want to find a job, because Germans are still, unfortunately, not that good in English on, on average, um, particularly not in the countryside. And when you want to work and, and I don't know, as a plumber or whatever, mm. that's what we actually need. But uh, no one understands Pashto in, in the rural areas of North Rhine-Westphalia. So that's <laughs> sometimes um, pretty harsh. And we're still trying to help. And... Um, from time to time it works from time to time it doesn't but was was that was that was that a political was it a political blowback uh when it come to the failure in afghanistan i mean you know in the anglo saxon sphere as as you you know there are a lot of you know self reflections not that lessons being learned but it's just that you know we're defeated we chose to be defeated uh you know the the us and the uk being special relationship allies um you know there are there have been so there were kind of some sort of political uh controversy accountability sense of accountability or at least the pressure on the for the, the early days of reflection which never really happened 
But how was it for Germany? Well, I mean, as I said, uh, when the Islamic Republic collapsed and the withdrawal was completed and Afghan started to flee, we were in an election campaign mm. between one government and a new one, which was clear would be uh, slightly different from its composition. So there was, uh, I heard uh, already technically in the ministries, not many people really dealing with that for, for quite a while. Um, and uh, then very quickly, Ukraine happened um, and now Gaza, Israel, Palestine um, and Afghanistan has actually dropped to a large extent from, from the public view. Uh, it's not so that people are not interested when, when I'm going and uh, do, I don't know, presentations or podium discussions about Afghanistan. There's always a lot of interest, but it's a particular group of people. Uh, those who have been to Afghanistan in civilian or military capacity, families who have uh, sometimes even adopted Afghan refugees under age and so on, people who are working with Afghans here and are in the asylum sphere, so to say. They're very much interested also in the media here and there, um, but it has dropped from attention. And, and there's in the moment we have a parliamentary commission and a parliamentary committee uh, uh, looking at uh, one looking at the whole mission and the other at the evacuation um that's very very interesting um but the thing is you barely find anything about it in the media mm. even in the social media there are just a few people who try to keep that alive myself included um but there's not much response unfortunately it's it's very very sad um because it, it was a big failure it was a catastrophe for Afghans, but it was also a catastrophe for our countries because we were not able to uphold democratic values, um, mm. which we share with Afghans. Whatever they call it, democracy in Afghanistan uh, is not a very good word, which had to do with that uh, party in that country, which called itself Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, Democratic People's Party, and so on. But of course, you also have in, in Farsi, Madom Salari, which is the same yeah. thing, and not tainted. And in Pashto, you could do the same thing. Um, yeah, I mean, we let them down. We In the beginning, we did not trust them that they could do something like that. How often did I hear it from higher ranking politicians? Oh, these Muslim countries, they are not uh, made for democracy. I also heard it from Afghans. Oh, we uh, need to be rich first, or at mm. least. Mo, uh, not that poor as we are currently and we need better education um, before we can grapple what democracy uh, uh, is about which I always thought is wrong and uh, which I also learned in Afghanistan from people who were be sawat but not be aql eh? uh, I mean <laughs> uh, illiterate but not stupid I mean I heard the best analysis to the point uh, from people in the countryside in Uruzgan in, in Paktia where I worked um, and I was always flabbergasted, and I always put those in, in, in my reports because uh, no one could understand politics better than those people who are really influenced by, by them, um, sometimes against their will or, or, or feeling incapable of doing something about what's going wrong, but at least, and that was also something which I hope uh, could play as a role as a Tajuman, as a translator there, to translate what Afghans were saying. Uh, into our political sphere by by writing about it and reporting about it and so on and but also I, in, in, in German put it in one sentence and this for me it's very important I think Afghanistan had the capabilities and still has it to become a democratic country to move towards democracy I mean how long did it take Germany we had our first parliament uh, in 1848 uh, and when they ended their debates uh, the troops were already waiting outside and shooting everyone involved in that and it took uh, west germany till 45 and us in the east to 89 1989 uh, until there was a democratic system which has many flaws um but you need to start that at some point and my feeling is that during the lawyer jirga some of those people who have had influence in the west like khalil zad like uh, brahimi in the un uh, some of the ambassadors and so on they didn't believe that afghanistan can become at least, or can move towards democracy. They thought that's one of these warrior societies and uh, and they re-empowered the warlords and they dominated the thing afterwards. And 
And well, this uh, kind of in a sense of is know, what President Karzai understood that he would not get military support against the warlords. You know, when Ismail Khan yeah. did a civil uprising in Iraq after Karzai wanted to take the wilayat, the, 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 yeah, the governorship from governorship from him. Um, I was in that meeting with the commanding general of NATO and my boss, the EU special rep, and the NATO told them, we don't do green on green. So it's your conflict. You you go ahead. That's when he learned that it's not about democracy. It's about being the strong. And that's when, when also the Karzai family started to develop, a, I call it the warlord wing. Yeah. In Kandahar. Ah. Uh, now, on... on there is a thing about you know you mentioned german elections um there is you know in the german election political shenanigans there is also you know the because of your political your electoral system you've also got an afghan coalition because of the tricolor of yeah, yeah so talk talk like about that because media, it'll be something uh, extra. No. of course the media picked that up immediately and then they yeah, decided yeah the media call it afghan well, like, afghan coalition right they didn't want to be associated with afghanistan uh, at all so they called it kenya they have the same colors i've changed it now yeah yeah i mean it's it's not an official denomination of course but also the kind of the media picked up kenya then later mainly ah. Yeah, because yeah. I, you know what you know, being a political geek, every time there's an election in in, yeah, in the by West, the way, on the it's on the um, not on the top level, on the federal level, as we call it, the the hmm. government in Berlin, which is we call it the the ampel, um, the traffic light. Huh? Yes, it's red, yellow, and green. Yeah, but we have black, red, green coalitions in some of the federated states, which is Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, and Green Party. Yeah, because during the 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 the, the you know after. Uh, Angela Merkel left, and the election—the election that you had, which brought Olaf Scholz. You know, during that election and the the coalition discussions, there were talks of Afghan coalition or yeah, you yeah. know things like that. But that's correct. Over two and a half years have passed. Afghanistan is a totally different country, and are you surprised that how quickly and how easily the Taliban have managed to dismantle all of that that you'd worked for so long? In a way, not. I'm a bit surprised how efficiently they're doing it currently. Um, it was clear what their worldview is. But worldview, of course, is also not only an abstract thing. Of course, um, I, I believe that they're very much motivated by what they understand and the Sharia and so on. Mm. And that this is the absolute non plus ultra and uh, all those western values uh, um they also defeated them so they're, they're yeah. feeling very strong and invincible in the moment but the thing is also it's about the political circumstances i think also the taliban were surprised how quickly they were able to take kabul i think they were preparing for still a fight um there were those attempts to have an interim government uh, kind of composed from the, Talib, uh, from the Taliban and um, remnants of the Islamic Republic and so on. Um, there were those talks in, in Doha. Khalil Zad has uh, uh, confirmed that. Uh, I also heard it in the hearings here in the German parliament about Afghanistan, that there was a plan to have such a government by 1st September 21. Um, that then the president, the then president Ashraf Ghani fled the country collapse the whole thing but i think it's not him alone also i mean i still remember mr attar and mr dostum in their uniforms sitting in those elaborate uh, armchairs saying we will fight to the last drop and and so on and next day they were somewhere else um it was this this what now i think is euphemistically called a republic um was something like a colossus on um a hollow colossus. Hmm. I mean, it probably wasn't even the colossus. I mean, the, the armed forces on paper were, but um, and it was hollowed out. It was hollowed out by the lack of attempt to make it more democratic, by accommodating the warlords, by not taking them and everyone else who was included in atrocities, I mean, the PDPA people and so on, uh, uh, to account. And so what looked democratic from the outside 
was a facade parliament and so on. People were still very eager. I mean, the first elections, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And so it, it went from election to election. And it, it was so blatant how there was the cheating was going on also by all sides not only the winners cheated also the losers cheated and uh, uh, i mean i remember those discussions also in our office uh, where people were thinking about should i still go to that uh, election and then afterwards trying to emulate something which didn't happen uh, um, like what the iranians did uh, where's my vote you know yeah. after the election before and you yes know, yes and so on um, i mean there were people who wanted to live that and they were aware that the institution and so were very weak um, but there was never a reliance on really on let's call it the voting population in Afghanistan they were all manipulated and bought and the bad thing is that also people were bought who didn't have it necessary to be bought because they already had money and so on I mean there are a lot of poor people in Afghanistan who were happy to take a meal uh, or a coat or whatever uh, uh, some of the candidates uh, handed out but I mean, there were enough people, as I said, uh, be so what, but not be Akko. Mm -hmm. um, they would take the kebab or the coat and vote anyway for yeah. whatever. But, but the thing is, um, the Afghans who actually, the politicians who controlled the electoral institutions were technically so well versed to manipulate it that the voting didn't count anymore and people really had to face security threats and whatever i mean we all know that uh, shooting and whatever and the shooting did not only come from the taliban they were also kind of staged taliban attacks one candidate bought a couple of mm. bad masks and and attacking a, a, a polling station and so on so that they could stuff the ballot boxes and so on um those who counted decided and those who computed and I remember one of the elections somewhere in the middle of the Islamic Republic where there was an OSCE mission with a big computer terminal in, in Kabul Hotel, I think it was. And they said, we're seeing it here on the screens that they are cheating, that they're manipulating the figures. Uh, the comma is going to the left or to the right for certain candidates and whatever. But we don't know how they do it because there were four <laughs> systems independent of each other. So they must have simultaneously be able to manipulate all the four systems. And those were people who did a lot of elections in other countries. That, that was not just someone who said something. Those were yeah. people who were highly knowledgeable. And that was one of the most shocking moments of many shocking moments I experienced there. And that's actually when I really lost the rest of my hope and those elections were manipulated and then the, the results accepted. Again, not rocking the boat, let's have a unity government or something like that, which from the beginning was clear it wouldn't work. But the thing is, you know, all these men, corrupt and fantastically rich, they became, um, but they fled and stuffed all of that riches to, you know, outside banks, the UAE, Turkey, Europe, other places. There we have need been to find out more about that. Yeah. And, and the thing is, what I wanted to ask you was that why hasn't there been a sense of a push? For accountability from these men, largely men. And do you think also some women? Yeah, some women, of course, you know, I said largely men. Mm. And do you think if there was a concerted effort by the EU institutions, any countries that they've taken refuge in, to hold them accountable for what they've stolen, at least? You know, I mean, they've stolen their taxpayers' money. So yes. actually, there should be a concerted effort, but I don't see it. And anyway. I think that that, uh, that the reason for that, as I suppose, you know, there'll be a tomorrow after the Taliban. But, you know, to have that sense of accountability, okay, you guys, you have no place in the regional countries. You've fled to Europe and ca elsewhere with all the money. You have to be able to answer for those money. Because these are our taxpayers' money that went to Afghanistan and then should have gone to the people of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but you've got plush houses in London and Paris and all that places. Why has I mean why hasn't that happened? It's a very good question. It actually speaks for the lack of efficiency of our Western institutions. I think that that there's a portion of shame because my theory is that um I think it's a bit more than a theory that this kind of degree of corruption we need to allow 
to keep those allies with us to fight the Taliban because uh, we need more than just uh, those, how many were it, 100 something thousand mm. Western troops we had. Most of them were not fighting, but for logistics, like it is in any army, I guess. Um, but it were the Afghans who were fighting it, mainly the Afghan National Police and uh, to a lesser extent the army. And uh, um, yeah, uh, it needs a concerted effort. And it was the shame that they lost this, let's call it conflict, the war, um, that they used it as a political means. I mean, there were all these handbooks in the US with the US military money as a weapon. Uh, mm. I remember very early on uh, uh, people writing about it and criticizing it, um, that it was not only about money. You also needed to, I mean, the, the, the slogan, uh, uh, what was it, hearts and minds, it was not bad. It was kind of just a cliche. You couldn't hear it anymore after a while. But it was about the minds and the hearts. It, they needed to have a government support, uh, uh, which they thought would do good, which they didn't. And they needed the foreign allies of that government who would make that government do good. And they didn't. And it was clear from the very beginning how much money was going into corruption. I mean, I remember when was that? I mean, probably in 2003 or something. I went to Kunduz and there were all these new houses uh, being built and they called it the poppy palaces. Um, <laughs> and There are plenty of them know, in Kabul like as well. I asked, I asked the people on the street... Who owns that? And where does he have the money from? And they start laughing. Are you so stupid, you Khariji? And that <laughs> you don't know these are the guys, uh, uh, the commanders and the police chief and this and that uh, uh, who are uh, uh, using your money. And um, yeah, I mean, it, this is, you know, in this complete overall failure, there are these segmented failures which are still large, not doing something about past and current war crimes, not doing something about corruption, not doing something about the poppy economy, which was much stronger on the government side than on the Taliban side, um, etc. PP, we could have a list uh, where we need three more podcasts. Yeah, and I'm so grateful that you're so generous for your time. And it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating listening to you. Um, so, you know, looking ahead, where do you foresee Afghanistan heading to? And you know, there are talks, there have been talks of the ta the great engagement with the Taliban, deeper, deeper engagement with them because the human humanitarian crisis demands it for them to be, you know, a, a part of the, um, the, the, the the project. And of course, there is the elements of anti-Taliban resistance. And there have been talks of, you know, Taliban splintering and all of that. So how, how do you see things? Well, even as a and we always decline to make forecasts and we actually also drop this what many do in their reports to give recommendations and so on because no one's usually listening to them anyway um and you also cannot be sure <laughs> whether that's good what you come up with so forecasts i find it very difficult because i mean we have said when we were at university, there's one of these uh, three fundamental Afghan laws. And one of the laws that always happens, but differently from what you expect. And uh, that has been proven by reality a couple of times, so maybe in the future too. But in, in the moment, if I just do very ice cold analysis, mm. I'm not optimistic. I think the Taliban are there. They will be there for a while. We heard all this talking about the splits and the internal conflicts for 20 years, and there were active attempts to enhance them, to split them, and it never really worked. Um, I'm not expecting that it will work this time because the attention is much lower uh, given to Afghanistan. So um, there's no one who even probably would uh, try to attempt that. I'm, I'm not saying it should be done. I think it would not be helpful. But on the other hand, I'm also in favor of trying. I mean, I'm not a trained diplomat. I became a diplomat. And what I learned is that diplomats have to work. In, in German, we have that sentence. I'm not sure I can translate it into good English. It's uh, drilling 
Thick we'll say it in German. We have got we have got listeners in Germany as well. Dicke Bretter bohren. Diplomatie is wie dicke Bretter bohren. To to drill through huge thick mm. um, wall, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And um, and as my boss used to say, you you never know what happens. You need to be prepared to do something. So complete isolation and so on will not help. Not and it will definitely not help the Afghan population. I'm always a bit flabbergasted uh, by those people who say, don't do anything. Um, you're funding the Taliban by giving money through the UN system and so on. Uh, I mean, the economic situation is so bad and the humanitarian situation is so bad that this would be murder. Hmm. Um, so it's the damned duty of diplomats to find ways not to sell out our values, but still work in Afghanistan and also work with this regime. I'm also not very optimistic that they will change very quickly. For now, they have learned if they are just stubborn, they get through with it. They, they did it in Doha. Uh, they did it now with this um, special envoy meeting and so on. Uh, but it's also not said that it will continue like this forever. I mean, we've had this uh, just that statement by what is he, Deputy Interior Minister of the Taliban, uh, saying that uh, the system only relying on Mujahid and Talib and Alim, Ulema, um, is not sufficient for Afghanistan. I mean, there seem to be people who uh, uh, feel strong enough to say that publicly. And I'm mm -hmm. sure they're more like that in the ranks of the Taliban. In the moment, it's not possible to talk with the leadership in Kandahar, also not for them, it appears. The, the, the opponents, how do you see their, the their, their chances or their hopes or their... Their futures, I should say. Well, the thing is, I mean, who are the opponents? The opponents are a lot of people who don't like the policies of the Taliban or parts of the policies of the Taliban who live in Afghanistan and who don't have any set up, any institution, how to make themselves hurt. The Taliban also block every little uh, gap where light can come in from. Um, but they're still there. I was very impressed by the women going out into the streets. Uh, it hasn't happened anymore for a year or so because it's just too dangerous also for them. I also remember interviews with some of them. We are going out because the Taliban cannot treat us as badly as they would treat our men because there was a lot of criticism that the men are not going out. We know that the Taliban take the families hostage and make them responsible for the behavior of their women or their... And of course, they've recently, they, they've began, you know, they have been abusing women as well, you know, those who have Absolutely. been... Absolutely. I mean, this, yeah, there's no discussion about that. That's the worst thing um, in any country in the world, uh, how they do it. Um, and still they had the courage to go out, but in the moment they need to look for, for other ways. And um, I, I don't believe that... I can understand that people want to take up arms and mm. fight against them. Some people are doing it. But um, I think after 40 years of war, not many Afghans are really happy to have another war or something like that. I mean, if they act in self-defense here and there locally, that might still happen. It has happened and it was crushed very quickly. There is no unity. There's, as usual, fighting about the leadership, also in exile. Let's call it the political wing, mm, the former mm. Tanzims and, and the different groups. Sometimes they do some statements together. and But I think it's it's too small. And um, for me, the major argument is that, um, well, it's of course for Afghans to decide whether they want it or not. But from my point of view, many of those people are, as Afghans would say, emta han so mm. they have already been, been tested. Yeah. And what it needs is a new generation. And, you know, that there's... Maybe also new families who take the lead. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I get you. I get you. Now, you know, we've we've talked a lot. I'm not You've talking a... only about one gentleman, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, areas. the dynasties. Afghanistan have, you know, the, the there are dynasties who, who operate like cartels. You know, they... they um, but your association with Afghanistan is... As long as the country's, you know, recent 
past, you know, war. Uh, and, you know, that's four decades of association with Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Looking at, at its future now, given the large number of, you know, the, the diasporas, you have German-Afghan children being born in, in, in Germany now, who are the products of the products of, you know, the, the, the 20 years of Western involvement in Afghanistan. But, you know, what, what are there that makes, I mean, are there things that makes you, that make you hopeful about, you know, if there's anything that make you hopeful about Afghanistan at this moment? Yeah, it's, but it's those people inside of Afghanistan and here who care about their country, their former country, when they take a passport here, but they still are double-headed or whatever mm. you call it. It's like me. For me, Afghanistan is also my kind of second homeland. I've spent 13 years in the country. I counted at some point. Um, yeah, that, that's hope that those people are there, that they know that they want something different from what's happening under the Taliban there now. I mean, um, yeah, it's just that there are no channels, no institutions or setups in the moment, which really can bring them together to make up their mind and then also influence those who rule in the country currently. Um, Maybe it needs time. There's no guarantee that it will happen mm. to an extent that uh, most of them, of those people are happy. We also should not forget that there are a lot of people also in the country, also amongst the women. We hear that through various channels who are just happy that the war is over. The war was so terrible. And it was not only, I mean, and particularly the last one, the last 20 years, it was not only the Taliban who were killing Afghan civilians. It was also our military and Afghan military and so on, sometimes recklessly and in many incidents have never been talked about and so on. And that's why we also need to understand that some people, some are forced to just to accommodate themselves because they don't want or can't leave the country. And others are probably even accepting the rule of the Taliban because they've seen so many bad things from people who claimed that they are the better ones. Mm. Now, uh, Thomas, what is your what is your favorite drink? You know, Germans <laughs> are known for their beer. So, you know, what what is your favorite drink? Um, Chaya Saps, of course, green tea. No, I mean, you know, the German in the German drink, not Afghan drink. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a beer drinker. Yes. Mm. So, when you're having your beer with your friends, talking, reminiscing about your time in Afghanistan. If you were to tell them something that would make them laugh out loud about a story, an anecdote, you know, let's end this, you know, we've covered so much and I'm so grateful for your time. I mean, could, we could, I could listen to you all day and night, uh, but we, we, we have to, you know, let you free. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when you're having your beer with your friends, um, you know, you want to make them laugh the laugh out loud moments of your afghanistan just share some of those anecdotes there are also very very many can i have two very quickly my first yes two match, two yeah yeah my first football match at kabul university dormitory when i came to the pitch and i thought what's going on here after a while i found out there were four teams playing at the same time two on the large pitch and two across on the small one, because everyone was wearing what he was wearing. I was never sure who was on my team. So that was... <laughs> so that was the younger days of... That was the younger days. And, uh, uh, and I like Afghan jokes. Mm. Have you heard about the Aklak? No. That, that's interesting. I asked many... It seems to be a local thing. One of my Afghan colleagues called me about the Aklak, which is the, the one with a little wit. Okay. And... Uh, I think it came from Logar or something. I also heard that there's an Akluk in Nuristani stories. Okay, um, the joke is uh, two guys climb on a tree and uh, don't find their way back down. So then the community is really uh, concerned and they said, we need to go to the Akluk because he always gives us good advice. And the Akluk comes and says, okay, take a rope, throw it to the guys. They should. Uh, tear the rope uh, around their bodies and then you 
pull which, pull them down which pull them down which they do and of course they both break their necks and the cluck starts crying <laughs> and goes to the side and sits in the sand and then the people from Munich say a cluck really i mean it was really good advice i mean it's those guys who were too stupid to deal with rope and whatever um and he said you are stupid i'm not crying because of these two stupid guys i'm crying because of you i'm thinking about the time when i'm still not when i'm not with you anymore what you will do without me <laughs> that's good thank you uh what could we do what could we do and thomas or teach I'm Lots. so, so grateful. Thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Your, you know, your insight's just incredible. Um, so thank you ever so much. Thank you. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you very much, Ro Yakubi. Maybe may the Ro be with you. <laughs>